The nights are getting longer. Halloween is fast approaching. And it's another dark, rainy evening. So what better time for me to share some more stories with you? I have been scouring the internet. And tonight I bring you eight true tales of paranormal encounters. Ghosts, creatures, and the things that haunt our nightmares. Over the next few weeks, I've got more story compilations on the way. I'll be covering what I think is the greatest paranormal series of all time, and an investigation into one of the most disturbing YouTube channels I have ever seen. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out. Okay, so let's get started with our first story this evening. Our first terrifying true life tale takes us to a military base in the Mojave Desert. I apologise for the poor writing quality. This is the first time since 2019 I have written all this down. I hope it interests you. This story is real and is my personal experience. Names have been changed. I joined the army in 1990 and got out in 1998 when I hit my midlife crisis. I joined the National Guard. A few, more than a few, years after joining the Guard, I was told I was getting assigned to a medical unit that was deploying to the Middle East. In January 2019, I reported to my new unit and learned that in addition to deploying at the end of the year, I would have to go through an NTC rotation with the unit. What a joy. NTC, for those who don't know, the National Training Center, is in the middle of the Californian desert. It's one of the most challenging training events the army has, and it's as close to hell as we can get on this ball of dirt. Or so I think anyway. Skipping ahead, our rotation at NTC was scheduled to back up to our deployment, meaning we had to deploy our equipment from Fort Irwin instead of shipping it home. So after 30 days in the desert, I got to watch my unit load up on buses and head home for a month while I got to stay at Fort Irwin and deal with packing, custom inspections and inventories. Out of around 5,000 guardsmen that made up the force, deploying around 300 of us had to stay behind. Because units don't typically have to deploy, Fort Irwin struggled to find a place for us to stay. The rotational unit locations were needed for the next unit that was coming to do some training in the desert, and the National Guard barracks at the post were needed for the California Guardsmen, who were doing their two weeks annual training that summer. So after moving around a bit, we landed in what is known as Augmentee Billeting. This is where units that come in not to train, but to assist the post full-time opposition force stay. Lucky for us, there were no augments needed for the upcoming training, so we got to use these barracks for three weeks. This is where my story begins. The work we needed to do was long and hard, but after two weeks, most of the heavy lifting was done and we started to enjoy some downtime. This coincided with our move to the Augmentee housing. When we first moved, the housing manager, a civilian, walked the senior leaders through the 12 buildings we were to occupy and the bathrooms we were allowed to use. The setup was typical for army short-term housing. Each building has two sides with bunk beds from front to back. The 12 buildings we occupied, along with some others, were arranged in a square with large bathrooms and open shelters for a meeting, eating, etc. in the area behind the buildings. Each unit had its buildings, and my unit had the one furthest from the assigned male bathroom. This was odd because directly behind our building was a male bathroom, but it was locked and it was not on the list to be assigned to us. Being older, I asked the housing manager, could we get that one assigned as well? Being older, I must use the facilities more often. I did not want to have to walk across the pad to the one male bathroom we had. He said, unfortunately, that one is not available, which I took to mean it had maintenance issues. Just my luck. 
Fast forward a few days and I was coming back from dinner with my team in Barstow, California. It was late and when we arrived there was a military police car parked in front of the building next to ours. Being sensitive to issues with the National Guard and the active duty, I decided to walk to the smoking area behind the building with the MP to see if I could find out who had messed up and what we could do to avoid paperwork. When I got to the end of my building and started to the smoking pit, I swear I heard a scream and running water from the locked bathroom. However, I also saw one of our senior females talking to an MP at the smoking pit while I looked at the bathroom as I walked by. I was more interested in finding out what was up with the MP. When I reached a female NCO I knew, she immediately said, You heard that, right? I said, Heard what? The scream? Yes, she said. It's been going on for half an hour. Looks like someone broke into the bathroom and is tearing up the place. Great, I thought. Someone got drunk and is going to get arrested. Please don't let it be one of my guys. I turned to the MP and introduced myself. I asked if she had been into the bathroom yet, and if she had any idea who was inside. She kind of laughed and said, No, both doors still have their locks, so I'm waiting for my NCOIC to get here with the key. About that time, two additional MPs arrived, and one said, Let's get this over with and they all started towards the bathroom. The senior MP turned to me and said, Sir, do you and the sergeant mind going to wait at the other door? I said we're not equipped to deal with some drunk, that's your job. He laughed and said no worries. I don't think anyone will come out that side. More a precaution if you don't mind. Satisfied, I walked to the sidewalk so I could see the back door. The noise from the bathroom was getting worse. It was clear all the showers were on from the steam. You could hear toilets flushing and what I assumed were stall doors banging. The MPs gave me a thumbs up as they went to unlock the padlock on the door. Suddenly, and I presume when they opened the door, all the noise stopped. All we could hear was the water running. And then the MPs given the military police yell as they entered. Shortly after that, we could hear them yelling clear as they moved down the building in cleared areas. When they got to the end of the building I was on, they started turning off the showers and moving back towards the other door. I went to the front door, wanting to see who they brought out. As they came out, the senior guy told his subordinates to make sure the power was off and lock up. He asked me and Pryla, the master sergeant who had originally called in the disturbance to walk with him. When we go back to the smoking area, he said, We didn't find anyone inside. I was indignant. Clearly someone had been in the bathroom. And I said, that's impossible. He held his hands up and said, Sir, this is not the first time this has happened. Every few months we get calls that someone is messing around over here. When we get here, we search and clear the building and find nothing but running showers. And if the bathroom has supplies, they will be thrown all over. But we never find anyone inside. I don't have an explanation for it. But from what I understand, this has been going on for years. There is a standing order that no MPs go into that bathroom alone. And at least one of the MPs doing a search must be male. What the fuck? I said. Why is that? He said he was not sure, but from what he had heard, a female MP had had unexplained injuries when she searched the bathroom alone. In my mind, I said this is bullshit, just the active army messing with the guard again. The MPs left, and MSG Pryler and I talked for a bit. She was originally from Louisiana and joined the NC Guard when she got out of the army at Fort Bragg. I told her I thought this was some bullshit prank by the MPs. She was not so sure. She said she thought it was supernatural. I was not convinced. Three additional times during our stay, people reported hearing noises, 
screaming and running water from that building. Each time the response was the same. Three MPs would search the building and find no one. When it came time to clear the building, I asked the housing manager for a moment when we were done. He looked at me and said, You have questions about the bathroom, right? Well, yes, I said. He looked at me and said, I need a cigarette. Walk with me to my truck. This is what he told me. In 2009, a soldier who was doing an augmentation mission from Fort Hood committed suicide in that bathroom. Sadly, this is not uncommon. Soldier suicide is at an all-time high. After his death, the housing team started getting reports of issues in the bathroom. The first incidents were with the stall door, the one where the soldier died, which would not stay on its hinges. They would get calls nearly daily that the door had fallen off, only to find it undamaged and laying on the floor. Then during the period of no units using the building, they would come to open it, only to find the door off and on the floor with the showers running. A few years later, he said, the MP started getting calls. Some were screams and yellings in the bathroom. Some were people being punched while showering. In 2012, the building maintenance team and MPs decided to leave the building locked. While it took one bathroom away, it was not worth the constant hassle of dealing with the calls. That's when the someone is trashing the bathroom call started. Early on, MPs would get the key and search the building, turn off the showers and lock it back up. However, one night a female MP got the call. She arrived, went in and was beaten, somewhat badly. After a long investigation, no one was ever charged with her assault. The MP herself said she did not see her attacker, but that punches came from all directions. This is when the unofficial policy of three MPs and at least one male on the team started. He looked at me and said, Sir, I don't believe in spooks and stuff, but whatever's in there, it scares me. I'll be honest, whatever's in there scares me too. This next person has a question for you all. There's a link to all these stories in the description. So if you've had an encounter, then be sure to let them know. They also mention a very infamous haunted location that I will be covering in depth on the tape library very, very soon. Has anyone in the medical field ever experienced seeing anything creepy while working in a hospital or nursing home setting? I was hired onto a job in an assisted living facility with approximately 20 or so residents. It was a few times I've seen this thing, but not as well as this one time. As I've said, I've worked in this assisted living facility, working 2 till 10pm. When night fell, they were simply the worst times for me. While working or walking the halls to make sure my residents were safe, I felt watched, and not just watched by like my other co-workers, or residents mind you. The evening shift only had two staff members after six, until the next shift arrives. Well as I said I felt watched, and it creeped me out, and it doesn't help knowing that this facility sat basically surrounded by the woods, but this small town was haunted and known to be the most haunted in the US. To give you a hint on where, it's also known for the Sally House. Back to the story. It was one evening in November. It was time after the residents cleared and headed off to bed, so for mine and my co-worker working with me as well, this night meant downtime. We decided to go outside for some fresh air and just play on our phones. That's when something told me to look. I turned my head and saw a tall man, 
that didn't look like any of our residents. In all black, facing us through one of the side door windows, facing the side porch where we were sitting. This man or thing had a top hat on, covering half his face. I don't know what I did or why I had to look away for a slight second, but I did. And when I looked again, he was gone. This next story was simply described as this person's creepiest home alone experience. When I was around the ages of 12 to 13, I would often be left home alone after school. My parents and my younger sisters normally didn't arrive home for about an hour and a half. I normally didn't mind being alone at all. I could eat wherever I wanted, watch TV at a loud volume without being yelled at, and yell about how shitty my day was to my friends on FaceTime without being interrupted. On that particular day I walked in the door and dropped my bags. All I wanted to do was eat a fresh bowl of mac and cheese and cry. I was exhausted, so I got to doing just that. As soon as I began to boil the water, I heard the unmistakable sound of somebody wearing big heavy snow boots walking around downstairs. I knew it couldn't have been anybody in my family, because my father, who was always the first one home besides me, wouldn't be home for another hour. Even if he had gotten home early, he would have messaged me, and I would have clearly heard the garage door open. To stop myself from panicking, I told myself that the washing machine was most likely uneven, and I should go and check on it. I turned the stove off, and just in case somebody was breaking in, I grabbed a giant kitchen knife and went downstairs. The washing machine or the dryer wasn't even running. My brain basically froze. I stood in front of the stairway for a good minute trying to figure out what I had heard. Trying to put some kind of calming explanation behind it. When all of a sudden, the room went freezing cold. And I felt somebody standing behind me. When whoever this was breathed down my neck, it was over. I full on sprinted up the stairs not only hearing footsteps behind me, but also hearing heavy breathing. When I got to the top of the stairs, I remembered I was holding a knife. I spun around to teach this motherfucker not to go into people's houses. And when I did, nobody was there. I assumed that the intruder had retreated downstairs, so I locked myself in the bathroom and messaged my dad. He told me to stay put and to not make any loud sounds. When I asked him if I should call 911, he said no. There I sat in the bathroom, trying not to cry, because my worst nightmare had finally come true. When all of a sudden I heard the sound of the heavy boots again, but this time they were walking upstairs. I quickly messaged my dad to see if he was home, he said no. I felt my stomach drop as the footsteps came closer and closer until they were right at the door. I covered my mouth with my hand but that still didn't cover the sound of my heavy breathing due to sheer panic. I could see the shadow of this person's feet in the crack underneath the door. I could hear him breathing on the door. I stood there, silencing my cries tears rushing down my face. I was horrified. All of a sudden I heard my dad's garage door open. A rush of relief filled my body. I heard the intruder running to my parents' bedroom. My dad checked the entire house. There was nothing, no broken windows. All the doors were locked. And of course there was no intruder. The only thing that was wrong was the basement. It was trashed, when my mother had just cleaned it that day. My dad joked about how it was just my imagination. He said that I was just paranoid. To this day, I still can't explain it. I know what I heard. 
I know what I felt. I think the creepiest part of that story is the dad. He dismisses the mess in the basement. And when his daughter tells him she can hear something in the house, he tells her not to call the police. Did he know more than he was letting on? Maybe this isn't the first encounter this family has had with that particular intruder. I love a good urban legend, and this writer has a great one from their small village. This is the story of the old monastery pool. There is a place near my village that I am too afraid to visit at night. They say Old Monastery Pool is haunted, and that this is the story which proves it. Just after the Second World War, and with rationing still firmly in place, trading any extra food you grew or caught was near necessity. A youth in my tiny Nottinghamshire village, known only as Young Charlie, understood this well. Back in those days, young Charlie could often be found in the Burrell Arms. I actually live there now. Trading the trout and eels he'd plucked from the local streams for rationing stamps. I suppose you know about the old monastery pool, one patron asked, as he exchanged a few stamps for one of Charlie's slender trout. Charlie shook his head. Never heard of it, sir. Plenty of big fish in the old monastery pool, lad, the patron continued. Used to be the monk's carp pond. They reared them for food hundreds of years ago. It's up in Glover's Wood. Trees moved in once the monastery was gone, but the pond's still there. Charlie's interest was piqued. Really? Have you ever fished there? Me? Nah. You need Allsop's permission, else it's poaching, and me and him don't get on. Mr Allsop was a local landowner that Charlie knew, but whilst Mr Allsop apparently had grievance with this man, Charlie had never got on the wrong side of him. How come you know there's plenty of fish if you've never fished there? Must be, answered the patron after a long swig of ale. Else why'd Allsop have refused all the folk who have asked to fish it? He's keeping all the carp for himself, miserable bugger. The next Sunday morning, there was only one thing on young Charlie's mind. Church was the only place he ever saw Mr Allsop, and so that was where he'd get his permission. Old Monastery Pool was full of ancient, monster carp and Charlie was desperate to catch one. Mr Allsop, Charlie asked after the service, is it true that there's an old carp pond up in your woods? True enough, young man, Mr Allsop answered, as they walked up the narrow church path. It belonged to the old monastery before it was burned down. Why do you ask? I was wondering if I might have permission to fish it, sir. I'd return any fish I caught, of course, unless you wanted me to bring them down to the manor. I don't think so, Mr Allsop answered dismissively. Now I'd best be off. Lots to do. Charlie was devastated. Fishing was his life, but he'd never had a chance to land anything truly remarkable before. A monster carp would be his crowning achievement, and would have the pub talking for years. The next Sunday, Charlie beseeched Mr Allsop again, but got the same answer. So he tried again the following Sunday, and was still refused. The Sunday after that, he had offered to do odd jobs around the manor to pay for his fishing. The Sunday after that, he had offered all the trout and eels he caught for a month. But still, Mr Allsop would not relent. Charlie tried and tried, Sunday after Sunday, never giving up. Eventually, he started calling in on Mr. Allsop at the manor itself. Lord, not you again, Mr. Allsop moaned when Charlie visited the manor for the third time in as many days. I'm just desperate to fish Old Monastery Pool, Charlie said, 
before Mr Allsop had the chance to usher him away. Please just say yes and I'll stop coming here. I'll never ask anything of you again, I promise. The answer is no. I've told... Why won't you let me? Charlie exclaimed. Why are you being such a grouch? Because of the abbot, Mr Allsop barked back. When he refused starving villagers carp after a felled harvest, they strangled him and burnt down the monastery to try and cover up the murder. He still... I don't care about some dead old abbot, Charlie interrupted. I just wanted one chance to fish the pond. Please, Mr Allsop, please. Fine, Mr Allsop answered, throwing his hands in the air. But don't come crying to me when... But Charlie didn't hear the end of what Mr Allsop had to say, because he was already running back towards his house. As soon as he had his fishing tackle, young Charlie raced across the local field toward Glover's Wood. What he found in the dying light disappointed him. The pond was easy enough to find, but it was clogged with pondweed and full of dead branches. Only a few patches of clear water remained, and Charlie thought he could see through them right to the bottom. It seemed that the water was only a few inches deep, hardly the sort of place that might harbour a monster fish. But he had come this far. Charlie chucked out a little stick float and worm, hoping that there might still be a few minnows around, maybe even an eel or two. Almost as soon as his float stood straight in the water, it was yanked under with all the velocity of a colossal pike strike. Charlie's line snapped instantly, but he didn't care. There was obviously something huge lurking in the pond. Maybe there was deeper water below the weed after all. The perfect hiding place for the giant carp he'd hoped would be there all along. Charlie wound in his loose line, sank back against a tree and reached into his basket and began switching to his most robust tackle. But in his eagerness, he couldn't resist a glance back up at the pond. Standing on the other side of the bank, amongst the trees, the sinister shape of an old man dressed in tattered, soot-stained robes. He said nothing. He just stared at Charlie through unforgiving, bloodshot eyes. Terrified, young Charlie shot up from where he was sitting and slammed his head straight into a low branch, knocking himself out. Night engulfed young Charlie when he came around. He remembered where he was, what had happened, and, his heart racing, sat straight to squint through the gloom. No sign of any old man, but to his horror, the fishing tackle by his side was smashed to pieces. Young Charlie stood and ran without retrieving so much as a broken float. This is a story that is endlessly passed around campfires where I grew up. Most of my local ponds are inhabited by mirror carp, and apparently they all descended from carp the monks used to rear in their monastery pond hundreds of years ago. According to local legend, the monastery was burned down when a cruel abbot refused fish to starving villagers after a failed harvest. In doing so, the abbot brought death and a terrible curse upon himself. Now he's doomed to patrol old monastery pool day and night, making sure no villagers try to take his precious fish. I have visited old monastery pool in the daytime, and can report that it is weedy, murky, and surrounded by twisted trees and thorny undergrowth. It is certainly an eerie, unsettling place. I don't mind admitting that I was too creeped out by the pool to stay for very long. On top of that, I've always been too scared to visit a night, or to throw in a fishing line like young Charlie did. In fact, I don't know of anyone in the village who's ever fished a pond, or been up there at night. However... 
even with the cautionary tales and all the whispers of curses and ghostly abbots, I still wonder what might happen if I did. One night when I was ten, I was woken up by my bedroom door opening, followed by someone sitting on my bed. I felt my leg grazed and the bed sink under a person's weight. It's just mum, I thought, and I opened my eyes. It was not my mum. I found an eyeless boy. He had black, empty sockets, about my age, sitting at the foot of my bed. He extended his hand, and in it was a little box. I was startled, but reached out. He pulled back. I reached again and said, give it. Then I blinked, and when I reopened my eyes, he was gone. But I could still see the imprint where he'd sat on my bed. Fast forward five years. My girlfriend came over to do homework. After she finished, she took a nap while she waited for her parents. When they arrived, I tried waking her up. She opened her eyes suddenly, looking up at a corner where the wall met the ceiling. She pointed there and went back to sleep. I shook her again. She came to full consciousness and I explained what she'd done. She looked haunted. She said, up on the wall, I saw a little boy with no eyes. He was there in a Spider-Man pose, staring at me. I freaked out and told her my story about the same kid. Fast forward another five years, I was with the same girlfriend and we had a two-year-old. We were living in my parents' house in my old room. My daughter started waking up at the same time every night and she'd talk. After a while I'd noticed she almost had the same conversation every night. I playfully asked her whom she was talking to. She said, It's a little boy. He's nice. He's lost. And looking for his mummy. My daughter's nightly conversations continued until we got our own place later that year. My husband and I own a martial arts school, and the building that it's in, which we also own, is about 130 years old, next to a church. And I never, and still don't really, there has to be another explanation, believed in the paranormal. But the things that happened in it didn't just happen to me. It was decrepit, which is why it was so cheap to purchase, and we basically did all the work ourselves. Old, creaky, drafty. A bunch of things happened there. Here's one. One Saturday morning, my husband was on his computer in another room. I'm in the apartment, playing with a Tamagotchi app on my iPad when I heard the stereo sitting in front of me click on and a girl's voice started talking from it. I thought he controlled the stereo from his computer, so I ignored it. Because he often put on music to work out before class started, he teaches the morning class. I do remember thinking, what kind of weird ass indie music is he listening to anyway? Because the voice just said, Hi, my name is... I thought I heard Katie, but I'm not 100% sure because I wasn't paying attention. I've never known a Katie in my life. I am years old. I'm from... etc. I didn't catch the specifics because I wasn't really listening. But that went on for about two or three minutes until it suddenly went, Something's hurting me. And when I caught that, I looked up and squinted at the stereo. Like, what? Something's killing me. Something killed me. At this point, the hair is standing on the back of my neck. I'm getting up from the couch to take a closer look. Please, someone tell my parents. 
Tell the teachers. Tell the corrections officer. At the words corrections officer, I just bolt into the other room and started yelling at my husband and cursing him out because I was certain he was playing a trick on me. Told him, we don't fucking play jokes about dead people. And he's of course looking at me like, what the fuck? When he finally calmed me down long enough to get what I heard out of me and what I was accusing him of, he told me it was impossible and led me to the stereo. It's not plugged in. When I was younger, I used to take naps upstairs. By the time I was eight years old, I absolutely refused to go upstairs. The upstairs had two large closets, attics. They ran from one side of the upstairs all the way through to the other side, on both sides. It was essentially a crawl space that was maybe 30 feet long. It started one day when a friend and I went crawling from one side to the other with flashlights, like kids normally do. And I saw a girl sitting there in the corner, acting like she wanted to play with us. I know a lot of people say that when they see a ghost, they aren't scared, just interested. Nope, I was beyond terrified. This girl looked normal, had blonde hair, a nice dress, and seemed friendly. I stayed silent, kept crawling behind my friend, and got out of the closet. I told him what I saw in there. He said he didn't see it, but felt like he didn't want to go back in. Then my parents would occasionally send me upstairs to get something, and when I would get up there, I would see the door swing open, as if they were trying to get me to come inside. I would lose toys and wouldn't be able to find them anywhere. Suddenly my parents would be fishing Christmas presents out of the attic, and we would find some of my toys in there. I remember being eight years old. My parents are still asleep in the morning and I leashed up my dog to go take on the monster in the attic. My dog, usually up for anything, refused to go off the top step into the attic. My parents never believed me with all the weird things that happened in that house. I would get blamed for things that happened all over the house, leaving lights on, toys all over, things I knew I didn't do. Well anyway, We moved out of there when I'm about 10. Not a week passed before the new owners called us up and asked if the house is haunted. Their daughter slept upstairs. She said that she'd been playing with a blonde haired girl at night. My parents laughed at how crazy these new homeowners must be. To make an already long story short, the girl started appearing in other parts of the house for them. They would look over while watching TV and see the girl sitting on their daughter's lap. They looked up on the computer at the past owners of the house and found an old dressmaker that lived there. And yep, a picture of the little girl wearing one of the lady's dresses. The earliest memory I have is of an experience with an apparition. Based on what I know, I was no more than three years old when I saw it. My parents didn't believe me and always had some explanation for me. We moved houses and tiny things would happen here and there. But once again, my parents always chalked it up to my overactive imagination. Fast forward to getting married moving into an old apartment and things started to heat up a little bit. Bins would get flipped over and the contents dumped on the floor. Then we moved in with my in-laws while my husband went to school. Cue the real events. The house would go through periods of high activity, particularly centred around me. My husband said he would hear me calling from another room, but I wouldn't be calling him. He would see me pass by the bottom of the stairs as he was coming down 
and would follow me all the way around the corner into the far room, only to dead end with the room empty. Here's the main story. My husband was working nights and I was home alone in the farm while the in-laws were out of state on a trip. One of the dogs goes into an episode, staring at nothing in the middle of the living room, absolutely losing it. Rabid dog. I can't get her to calm down. Usually a light touch on the back will snap her out of it, but I could not cool her off this time. I finally go to my room to take a breather and I hear her stop. Maybe 15 minutes later, she's at it again. I go halfway up the stairs and I'm talking to her through the banisters, finally getting her to come over to me and stop barking. She keeps looking next to me at the top of the stairs. Then a huge slam on the baby gate there happens, rattling the gate and the banister. I ignore it, because I've heard that's the best thing to do when something's right next to you. The dog barks, but I get her stopped again. Then right in my line of sight, I see a pen slide forcefully off the table, flying multiple feet before hitting the ground. The dog immediately runs to attack, and goes into another fit, looking at something next to the table. I start to lose it, and immediately go back downstairs to my bedroom. I sit on my bed next to my cat napping there. He stands up and comes to me since I'm upset and crying. I hear the dog move back to barking in the living room, closer to my room. A minute later, my cat turns to look at the doorway. His back raises up, ears pinned back, and his hair stands on end, looking straight at the doorway. I ran out of the house at that point. That was the worst it ever got. With what I know about the experiences through my life, compared with where I was staying, I've kind of begun to think it might be a poltergeist. That's all we have time for this evening. I hope none of these stories have been too creepy for you. Before you go, I've been having a thought about ghost stories in general as I've been reading to you. What if it's our belief in these beings that gives them life, that gives them power? What if sharing their stories is what keeps them appearing? What if listening to these stories is what draws them to you? Good night. Pleasant dreams. I'll see you next time.